Hello, OpenStack. <laughs> yeah, the mic works. Cool. <laughs> okay, so in this presentation, we're going to take you through some of the lessons learned from doing a thousand deployments a day on OpenStack. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take you through each of our particular scenarios where we may have had a problem and take you through how we resolved it. Uh, what we really want to do with this is just make sure that um, we share everything that we're, we're doing on the project, and hopefully some of you can learn from some of the, the lessons that we've learned on it too. So over to Dave. Okay, so I guess first we have the obligatory slide about our company. Um, so Paddy Power Betfair formed last year as a merger between Paddy Power and Betfair, surprisingly. Um, so historically, Paddy Power is kind of one of the largest uh, bookmakers in the world, um, and Betfair, Betfair is unique because it was the, it's the largest betting exchange, so it's kind of an online platform which enables people to bet against each other. Um, yeah, and the combined company is now on the, on the FTSE 100 on the London Stock Exchange. So we have a few offices spread across Europe, now branching out into the US and Australia, um, and that's a thousand engineers, over a thousand engineers spread across, across their lo those locations. And yeah, to give you some, some figures, uh, we do 135 million daily transactions, which involves 30 billion calls to our API, um, which is more than I think the London and the New York Stock Exchange combined. Um, yeah, and why are we at the OpenStack Summit? Because we built an OpenStack private cloud um, to, put, to run all this on. Um, yeah, and we're looking, getting towards 100,000 calls and about two petabytes of storage. So building this OpenStack architecture, so we've called this internally the I2 project for Infrastructure 2, which is a very creative name. Um, so these are some of, kind of the initial aims of the project. Uh, one of the big things was to have immutable infrastructure. So we deploy, we deploy lots of VMs, 1,000 a day is the, the figure we're going with. Um, so they're all like, so we have short-lived VMs, we don't do any in-place patching, um, and yeah, we wanted to like everyone here, I suppose, we kind of wanted to automate as much as possible. Um, so by delivering applications through continuous delivery pipelines. Um, we wanted a simple architecture that allows us to troubleshoot any issues easily. And yeah, we want to maintain everything in source control so that any, any changes are kind of verified. Um, and yeah. So one of the things with our, with our infrastructure as a service is we want to leverage APIs of all the different infrastructure components. Um, so that basically create Ansible playbooks which carry out common workflow actions across the infrastructure. Um, obviously, OpenStack is very good for this. Um, that also allows us to kind of use the, yeah, the OpenStack APIs uh, to avoid like any vendor lock-in. Um, one of the big things for, for Betfair at least was we'd historically just run out of one data center. Um, with this platform, we're moving into two DCs uh, and trying to make all the applications kind of active-active. So, yeah, this involves the developers having to work to de design the apps for failure and for us to design the infrastructure for failure as well. And yeah, we also, yeah, so we want to utilize a common tool chain for this continuous delivery. Um, so just using one tool for each operation. So this is kind of a high level, yeah, overview of what we've, the journey we've gone through, I suppose, over the last two years. Um, so it started off with a yeah, four-week proof of concept, um, which I think was about the time I joined the company. Um, so not a bad place to, not a bad time to join. Um, so this was with Red Hat, and we used Nuage Networks, so building out the reference architecture and basically proving we could deliver an application in a way that we wanted to. Um, so at that point, we're running on the Juno release. We went in September 2015, moved on to the Keeler release for the pilot phase of the project. So this involved, the end goal of this was to basically have two customer-facing applications on the platform serving traffic in production. Um, and in that six-month period, we kind of did the, the bulk of the initial work to set up the self-service workflow that the developers use with, to interact with the platform and self-serve, say, well, I guess we'll talk about it in more detail, but self-serve their infrastructure, their load balancing, their network requirements. After that, we went into a long phase of migration. So this was about the time of the merger. So we got set a very aggressive goal of onboarding 100 applications to the platform by Christmas last year. 
um, which I think we pretty much bang on achieved, which was very, very cool, and involved a lot of hard work from everybody. Um, and then moving into 2017, we still have the ongoing migration effort, and we've also had a few other kind of major infrastructure milestones. So we've done an upgrade of the Nuage component to the 3.2R10 release, and we also got the kit to build out a test lab, because, yeah, this was something we kind of lacked for a while, but now we were in a position where we've proven the platform, we are kind of given, given the resources to be able to build out a test lab in which we can kind of, yeah, try out new, new OpenStack projects or, you know, new functionalities. And here we are today in May, and we're looking in the next, over the next month or so to upgrade from Kilo to Newton. Yeah. Still Newton. Um, yeah, and also upgrade Nuage again to the 4.0 release. Yeah, so there was a session earlier on that Jan and Billion did on immutable OpenStack infrastructure, so you can check the video out for that to show how we're going to do that upgrade. Okay, so this is our reference architecture that we've built. So as Dave touched upon, we have active active data centers. Uh, to start with, before we were actually building out Open, OpenStack, we needed core services to be available. Um, so we have a minimal WIDR cluster that hosts our LDAP, NTP, and DNS servers. We needed to do this because it was a full greenfield project where we didn't want to bridge back to our native network at all. We wanted to build this in isolation and then migrate applications onto it. So our architecture is based on the leaf spine architecture from Arista. And um, so basically we have our, uh, our spine switches that are configured, and then they build a, a BGP fabric with each leaf switch sitting top of rack. So we have two leaf switches sitting at the top of each rack configured in MLAG mode. And then what we do is we translate that with our SDN controller, and that advertises all of the root, routing protocols to the Nuage um, SDN solution. So the way it works is, the SDN solution plugs into each of our OpenStack um, clouds. We run two per DC. The original premise for this was we wanted to separate our, tool, our delivery tooling. So stuff like Jenkins, ThoughtWorks Go, GitLab would sit in one of the OpenStacks. And then we would have the infrastructure OpenStack for um, test environments and production workloads. We're since... Um, Reevaluated that, and we're going to collapse that down to one OpenStack per DC uh, because the mainta maintainability over uh, managing four OpenStack clouds is, is quite high, and we're a lot more mature now with the Newton release. So um, we're going to scale out multiple more hypervisors in the one region. So the way that we provision hardware is we will essentially configure RAID configuration using HP OneView. We use a series of Ansible playbooks to do that, and then we turn it over to um, the RHEL OpenStack director, which will scale out our compute nodes. At the top, we have our global load balancer, which then feeds into our SRX firewalls. We then have uh, two tiers of Net Citrix NetScaler, the first tier is used for SSL offloading uh, on the hardware, and then we use the, the Citrix NetScaler SDX to basically route traffic down to each of our microservice applications in each DC. So we have dark fiber between the data center. So the way that uh, we bridge external networks into that overlay bubble that's created by Nuage and OpenStack is by using the Nuage VSG. So the VSG will connect external networks such as our, our native legacy network so that we can actually, we're not doing a big bang where we're switching all of this on at once. We're migrating specific workloads over to the new OpenStack and then we're bridging back for the application dependencies. As we migrate more and more applications onto the platform, obviously there'll be less bridging back to the net legacy network and we'll drain all of the previous network down and move everything into OpenStack eventually. 
So it's completely mirrored, as you can see, and what we're going to do is going to walk you through the next steps. So as I touched on before, we basically use um, delivery tooling that's installed in the tooling OpenStack. So we use for our continuous integration, we use Jenkins. Um, that will actually package all of our continuous integration builds, and we build lots of RPMs for that. We also use Jenkins to tag specific repositories for our everything is code uh, mandate, which will essentially tag. Um, in GitLab, we essentially tag our um, load balancing, our networking, our developer code, and our common workflow actions, as Dave touched upon before. For our source control management, we use GitLab. For our repositories, we use JFrog Artifactory. And for our security scanning, we use Qualys. Then we give developers the option of using Chef or Ansible to install their application. When we're orchestrating against the OpenStack APIs, we wrap everything in an Ansible playbook. We had a lot of heritage uh, with Chef. One of the creators of Chef actually used to work at Betfair. Uh, so a lot of the applications were written in that. It would be too much upheaval for the development teams to basically rewrite everything in Ansible, but we now give some of the teams the option of Ansible or Chef to, to install their applications. OK, so I think now we're just going to talk briefly about some of the design decisions that have been taken along the way. Um, sorry. <laughs> so first off, uh, yeah, we wanted to, we're going to tackle the issue of permissions. So we're building this new infrastructure. We want this to be infrastructure as a service. So we want the developers to be able to freely and as safely as possible be able to interact with the infrastructure. Um, so I think probably the most important thing here is that the only way people can change uh, infrastructure is through a deployment pipeline. There's no logging into boxes and, or logging onto net scalers or whatever and doing stuff manually. Um, as this is all, all done through our GitLab source control, any changes can be verified, um, yeah, verified by the appropriate teams before they go in. And if we do bump into issues, there's kind of a, a traceable, easy to tra it's easy to trace how, how things have gone wrong. So our deployment pipelines, we have kind of dedicated service accounts that interact with all the different infrastructure components. Um, and because, yeah, because we're leveraging the OpenStack APIs to do all the interaction, we basically just set up read-only access for the developers. Um, I'm not sure how, how much they really log into Horizon, but it is useful if you want to see, yeah, your tenant's usage, um, yeah, and how, yeah, view your hypervisors and VMs. Um, so yeah, we have Keystone v3 to do this, basically. So we have a dedicated uh, LDAP domain um, that plugs straight into the legacy Betfair LDAP server. Um, so yeah, that's, that's seamless. Um, what we did have to do was create a bespoke read-only role um, in Keystone, um, which means yeah, editing all these different policy.json files on the OpenStack controllers for all the different services. Um, which is a bit of a pain, but uh, once you've got it working, it's kind of just is there and works forever. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the things that would really benefit is having an out-the-box read-only rule um, and having that ability, because if you're doing an infrastructure as code, everything is code model, you really don't want people going into the GUI and doing it, but they still need the ability to view it. Okay, so some of the design decisions that we made were in terms of team setup. So I'll just take you through how we arranged our team to actually achieve it. So in the uh, pilot phase, we needed to create an unimpeded team uh, that was free to create the self-service automation. So what we did was we ring fence particular resources and moved them into a cross-functional team. So we had network engineers, database guys, we had um, infrastructure guys, and some development guys that came into that team. We wanted feedback from the community on what their frustrations had actually been with the previous platform that we put in. So we took all of that data and basically made a series of design decisions based on that. 
We wanted to set up a, a model where they continually improved and iterated on it. So what we did was we created T-shaped teams. So T-shaped teams, if you don't know what T-shaped teams are, are you have a deep dive specialist knowledge in one particular area. You then have a breadth of knowledge. And what you'll do is you'll share that breadth of knowledge with other team members. So someone that didn't particularly know networking could work with closely with a guy that was a specialist in networking, and then that would bring them on to actually understand network conventions. And then that expands your team, the knowledge within it, and makes for a better team and more well-rounded team. So the way that we set this up was we broke out all of the self-service workflow actions that we wanted each team to work on. So we had 12 engineers based in the core team. We did daily stand-up so that they were collaborating all together. So in the truest sense, this was really a DevOps model. We then had each team member focus on a particular piece of the puzzle. So what we tried to do was we got team members from different locations to work with each other, maybe people that hadn't worked together before. So for instance, we had people that looked after the OS image creation. So we used Packer for that. What we did with that was we needed CentOS 6, uh, CentOS 7, um, Windows 2012 R2 images. So they worked on actually creating the base images and doing all the automated patching techniques. We also had people that were working on Nuage. So Nuage was new for us. We had to orchestrate all of the common workflow actions, such as creating ACL policies, such as um, basically setting up subnets from scratch, and doing all that, of that integration work with Ansible and the OpenStack and Nuage APIs. So that was two people went away and did that. We also had people looking at load balancing for net scalers. So what we wanted to do was take the huge monolith config file and break it down so it was application centric so that we could demystify that. So that when teams created load balancer config, it was split out into each application. So that was a massive project for us as well because we wanted to automate everything. If anything was completely manual in the cycle, then it wouldn't do because of the speed that we wanted to operate at. We also had a team, that, uh, our system reliability engineering team, that went away and worked with some other guys to work in, out and put in Sensor, which was the tool of choice for monitoring. On the OpenStax side, we worked on common workflow actions, such as creating flavors, creating host aggregates, creating uh, virtual machines, and basically sorting out all of the identity services that you were integrating with. So that was a huge piece of work as well, and that was all done in this model. Then we had our uh, delivery tooling. So we wanted to be able to treat the, the tools that we use every day the same way that we did customer-facing applications. So that meant deployment pipelines for everything. Before, people would just be logging onto a box, install Jenkins, and then that would live in that box forever. What we wanted was immutable infrastructure for our delivery tooling. Same for our internal services. We wanted to be able to deploy DNS, NTP, and LDAP each day. So the workflow that we've used for OpenStack, we've actually applied to Lidvert as well. So the same workflow is used to build out that tooling. So even if we went to a, a public cloud platform, we'd be able to substitute that in if we wanted to burst into public cloud at a later date. OK, so another design decision uh, that we made was we wanted the team set up for the migration. So that was OK when you were building out the, the main building blocks for this project. But what we needed to do was when we went into migration phase, we kind of had to reorg uh, the organization to support the onboarding and ongoing maintenance of OpenStack. So this is the way that we set it out. So we have a, a team of around six engineers to look after the core infrastructure. Because we've automated everything and built those building bricks, sorry, this looks like something out of a war thing, doesn't it? I've just noticed that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, 
yeah, your, your country, Nietzsche. Anyway, um, so you've got six um, engineers that look after the core infrastructure. So that's doing the upgrades, completely automating everything, and making sure that we can do upgrades of OpenStack and upgrades of Nuage. Uh, then at the same time, what we've done is we have different locations where they need to onboard onto the platform. So we have six engineers that assist with the self-service automation and teaching the teams to actually self-serve themselves. We don't want to be a blocker, so we teach them how to fill in their self-service config files and basically use the platform. So all that they're really doing is filling in YAML files for networking, virtual machines, and everything. And we'll take you through that later. Cool. So the next design decision was really the logical division of network kit and hardware. So OpenStack, as you know, is quite open in terms of how you can set up availability zones and everything. So some of the decisions that we needed to make was how to segregate hardware in OpenStack. So that means how do we split up host aggregates, availability zones? Do we use multi-region OpenStack, or do we use a single region? Um, and how do the Nuage layer three domains map in? Because Nuage as well, uh, for those that haven't used it, is fairly flexible as well. You can do it, arrange it in different ways. So what we needed to do was make a decision on that during the pilot phase on how we would segregate out the platform. So this is really how we segregated the hardware and infrastructure. We use Citrix NetScaler. So we have, for test environments, we have a, a physical MPX and SDX. We then, within Nuage, had a layer three domain mapped to a particular availability zone in OpenStack. The way that we use availability zones in OpenStack is for it, test environments. So essentially, we have a quality assurance availability zone. NXT is our integration environment. And then we have a perf environment and a, a prod environment. So with mapping that to Nuage, you basically have a segregation between each of those environments based on the, the layer three domain. And then underneath it, we have our pure storage, which is our flash storage that sits across all the environments. We've sent, since introduced more flash storage arrays with pure storage, uh, but we didn't have time to update our slides, evidently. <laughs> and again, this is just completely mirrored in the uh, second DC. So your, your clicker is working, Dave. You just yes. probably thought it wasn't. OK. So how did we split up our, our new edge configuration? So the way it works is each time when we uh, create a particular microservice application, that's mapped to a particular zone in Nuage. Off of that, you have an ingress and an egress policy, which displays all of the particular ACL rules for that particular microservice application. You then have a particular subnet that comes off of that zone. So for instance, from a security perspective, if you looked at that particular zone and the associated policies with it, you would be able to see the application topology for that application and completely audit it. So one of the things that, and challenges we had with software-defined networking was, how do you manage security policies? So without uh, the micro-segmentation of the new edge firewalls, Essentially, there was concerns originally over, would this work for security? So generally, they had big allow rules in the firewalls, and they couldn't actually work out what application, uh, what their application topology was. So now what they can do is they can look in source control, they can see a YAML file, they can see what particular ports an application is using, and they can also look in new edge and see the corresponding one on the on the policies. So this has helped massively with um, security audits, where we can just show precisely what we're doing to auditors. Next. OK, so we've seen what we want to do with Nuage. We know what we want to do with OpenStack. Um, how do we actually deliver this? And this is where we, we build our continuous delivery pipeline. Um, so we've got some pretty cool pictures of pipelines here. Um, 
but yeah, so in the beginning, we were kind of a small cross-location team. Um, so we, yeah, what we didn't want to happen was each location would go and build their own thing, um, because that's just going to become completely unmaintainable. Um, so we wanted kind of a consistent pipeline which would allow the developers across all the different locations to be able to carry out the same workflow actions um, with ease. Um, what we wanted to have basically was a common way to create networks and set up the ACR rules in Nuage, um, a common way for creating VMs in OpenStack, um, a common way for installing the software other than the whole chef versus Ansible thing. Um, the same way to set up the load balancing on the net scalers, and yeah, a consistent way to onboard the applications. Um, and part of this is that we wanted to take feedback from people in all the locations so that we could continuously improve on how this, how this workflow worked. So this is the pipeline we came up with. Um, so I'll just give you a quick overview of the different stages here. So Basically, we start by get prerequisites. This is just going to GitLab, getting all the playbooks and the configuration files we, we require, and uh, at the versions that are specified, basically pulling them down to the ThoughtWorks Go agent, which is basically the agent which then runs all the Ansible playbooks. Um, we then set up prerequisites in OpenStack, so that's creating the flavors and host aggregates that are defined. Um, we have a capacity check to basically ensure you have enough, enough uh, RAM and disk uh, on the hypervisor to actually be able to carry out the deployment. Create L3 network, so this is using the Nuage APIs to create the, the subnet in Nuage, apply those ACL rules, and also create the corresponding entities in OpenStack. Um, once that network is there, we can launch the VMs onto it. Um, what we do is we tag a bunch of metadata at that stage, which is then used by the later stages in the pipelines to make a whole series of decisions. Um, once we have our VMs there, we can run Ansible or run Chef, um, depending on your preference, to install the software on the box. Um, and then we can do the interaction with the Netscaler to basically create a VIP for the application. After, at this point, we have the rolling update. So we're doing AB deployments here. So we have, yeah, the A, the A deployment is live. We want to roll the B deployment into production. Um, so for a lot of the applications, this is kind of, we just kind of take one box out of the load balancer, put one box in. Um, but we've actually made this stage customizable for things like stateful applications where there's more complexity involved. You maybe have to interact with Cinder or Manila to do your rolling update. Um, and at this point, yeah, we run a, a test job, which is defined by the developers. And if this all passes successfully, we basically clean up the previous version. So destroy the old VMs, destroy the old network. And then at this point, you will basically, if this is your QA pipeline, you will promote to your next testing environment, so NXT, and go all the way through eventually to production. OK, so we have our pipelines defined. Um, as we said, there's probably going to be a minimum of four environments per, per data center. So that's eight pipelines for each application. So we need a way to be able to create those quickly and create those in a repeatable fashion that's consistent. Um, so yeah, what we, we embarked on a project basically to automate the creation of the pipelines, which we called Go Pipeline Builder, which is basically just having a YAML file because everybody loves YAML because it's really easy, and then having a script that interacts with the Go API to create those pipelines. So in here, you can basically define all the different environments you have and yeah, pass some other relevant parameters. And this is what it ends up looking like, um, your different pipelines and your different environments built out. Yeah, so one of the other decisions that we made was to make YAML files um, the main uh, source of truth. So each application, as Dave said, will have a minimum of four pipelines per data center. And then we will essentially have eight pipelines in total to go through each of the availability zones. So the way that we've set this up is to make it simple for developers to use. So our VM naming standard is here, so you can see it's named this way. So we use YAML lint to make sure that people fill this in in this particular standard. Then moving on, 
developers will specify their flavor, so they specify the vCPU, RAM, and disk space that they want for their particular application. So this inventory file, each development team will have one per application, and then it will actually have multiple different environments specified on it, so you can see the particular flavors that you, they use for all the environments. Aside from this, as Dave said before, you have your host aggregate and hypervisor that is going to land on. What we wanted to do was give each team an allocation, uh, a hypervisor allocation, and let them control how their applications land on the hypervisor. So we tag the, behind the scenes, what we do is we use the Nova extra specs filter, where we'll tag the metadata for that particular TLA, tag the host aggregate, and then when you spin up, virtual machines with that particular um, flavor, it knows to land in that particular hypervisor. This also means that we design our data center for failure. So essentially, a production application will be mapped across two hypervisors or more. This means if you have a failure of a hypervisor, it only takes down a percentage of the stack, and there's no customer impact. OK. And as we touched upon before, this is the role that they'll use. Um, this one's called app, which isn't real, obviously. <laughs> OK, so these are some of the, yeah, as we talked about, we have the self-service files. So this particular one is for the new Arch interaction, so basically defining the ACL rules we want. Uh, so yeah, here we have the ingress rules. This is from the point of view of the VM you're deploying. Um, yeah, so here we have some examples of rules using TCP on various ports. Um, and we also have the enterprise network entity, which is basically the entity in Nuage that allows you to bridge to external networks. So you can bridge back to the native network or to the other data center, or even between different domains in Nuage. And again, we have some egress rules on, on yeah, ports. But the idea of this is that it's kind of a simple format which allows the developers to define the access rules they want in a really easy way. And similarly for the load balancer, so at the top we basically have domains. This corresponds to kind of the internal and external BIPs that exist on the NetScaler. Um, yeah, below that we have the LBV servers, which basically defines your load balancing method um, and yeah, the properties that will be associated with your service on the NetScaler. And then below that, you see we define these monitors, which is just a health check for your services. And at the bottom, this roll percentage, which is when we do the rolling update stage of the pipeline, this is basically how many boxes we act on in turn. So we act on, we put one in or one out or more if we desire. Yeah, so along the way, we obviously had some speed bumps. We call them the speed bumps. We don't like to say problems. Okay, so yeah, the first one was, well, the first big one was we had this issue with launching VMs when we got to a certain scale. Um, at first, we were kind of, we didn't really know what was happening. Um, it seemed that some VMs would just come up fine, some we'd have a problem with. Um, started to get some clues from the OpenStack logs. Um, basically, the issue seemed to be something to do with requesting ports from Neutron um, or creating ports in Neutron. And um, what we discovered was we're basically hitting a timeout um, because in Nuage, whenever you would spin up a new, vet, new virtual machine, it has to apply the ACL rules to the vPort on the in open vSwitch. Um, and basically, when it was doing that, Nuage would query the entire, all the ACL rules in the domain to see which ones it had to apply. And we basically, we, as we had deployed more and more apps onto the platform, you have more and more rules so this query would take longer, and we basically hit timeouts in Nova and Neutron. Um, so the short-term fix for this was to basically make these changes in some config files uh, to increase the timeouts in a cascading manner. Um, so in the short term, that got us over the pain. Uh, we were able to launch VMs again, which is pretty critical to basically us being able to do any releases whatsoever. Um, but this is obviously an unsustainable solution, because VM launch is really slow. Um, the platform is going to scale way beyond this, and we're just going to hit the problem again. So what did we do? We upgraded Nuage. Um, so basically, in the 3.2.10 release, um, this query had been refactored and yeah, basically just worked a lot better. So at the time, we were going from like 90 seconds in some cases to launch a VM. 
um, to like milliseconds from the from the nuage's point of view. Yeah. So another issue that we we had when we we built this in into our pipelines, when we had failures, you have multiple different ways that things can fail. So building in logic for all of those particular scenarios is very difficult. So that was the premise that we had when we started out with this. So what we wanted to do is develop a solution. So we use metadata for this. So essentially, we introduced something called pipeline status on the metadata of the VMs. So at this, the stage when we are um, launching the virtual machines, they go into an in-progress state on the metadata, and we just tag that using the OpenStack APIs. Then when we get to the rolling update state, we basically put the old boxes that are moved out of service into an old state, and we put the new boxes that are rolled into service into the live state. This may sound very simple, but this was very powerful for us. Then essentially, if you've got a breakage at any point in that pipeline, the setup prerequisites when it's issuing the new pipeline from the start will clean up any of the boxes that are still in in-progress state so that it doesn't block that next pipeline going along. Because we use AB deployments, you have an A deployment or a B deployment that's live, and then if you have a broken pipeline on the A or the B deployment, this will clean it up before. OK. Uh, conscious we've probably only got a couple of minutes, but this is kind of the last issue we were going to talk about, um, which was when we were trying to scale out our cloud, uh, we were running into problems where certain hypervisors, we'd lose contact with all the virtual machines on the hypervisor during a scale out, which is not ideal. Um, what this turned out to be was essentially a, I call it a bug or yeah, a, a bad bit of code in the version of heat we were using. Um, so on a, on a deployed node, you'll have the heat config, um, which in our version of heat, it's on basically mounted on a, it's on a temporary file system. Um, so any servers that are rebooted for any reason because it had a hardware issue, that, that folder would just be flushed. There'd be nothing there. Um, and then in our, yeah, in our heat templates, there's basically a, because of the, the Nuage install, there's a step where you, you in, uninstall the native open vSwitch and install the Nuage component. Um, on these ones that had rebooted, it would detect, well, heat, from Heat's point of view, this is a new node, I need to redeploy it. So it uninstalls open vSwitch. So you don't have a, a virtual switch. So yeah, you lose all connectivity to the VMs. And yeah, as I said, this is, in later versions of Heat, this is fixed. The problem is, this isn't a fix you can just apply on the undercloud. You need to apply it to your actual overcloud image that you use to deploy your overcloud nodes. Um, and changing that image once you already have a cloud is, is a kind of scary thing to do. Um, so at the moment, we've kind of put in a solution where we, we populate that folder, that heat config folder, um, so we don't bump into this issue anymore. OK, so one of the other design decisions that we made was to run one OpenStack per DC. As I touched on before, this is the target reference architecture that we're going to get to. So when we do the upgrade to the Newton release, we will run one infrastructure OpenStack, which will basically have all of our workloads, whether it's delivery tooling or uh, customer-facing applications and test environments. It will all reside under one region. Uh, we're looking at 650 co compute instances per DC for this. Um, yeah, so that was one of the main decisions. So the overall benefits of what we've done is we've reduced time to market. We do over 1,000 code deployments a day to test and production environments. We churn through around 3,000 virtual machines. Um, we've also lowered mean time to recover from failure. So those ThoughtWorks Go pipeline templates, you can essentially go to any different application and see what's going on. So you, you can understand it because they're not writing completely custom things each time. The only thing that's customizable is the Ansible Roller Chef recipe that they're using and the rolling update phase. So they, this makes it scalable and easy to track. Um, as I said, repeatable deployment process for apps. 
And then moving on, what we're going to be doing next is the Kilo to Newton release to get us to that new reference architecture. We're going to be doing that in the next 30 days. Um, some of the things that are coming as well are the OpenStack Ironic and Nuage integration. So basically, Nuage have a bit of custom code for Ironic that means when you deploy on the provisioning network your bare metal server, this is an overcloud implementation, then when you do a reboot, what it does is it will re-IP that particular server from the provisioning network and move it onto the tenant network, which allows you to ring fence in the ACL policies and give you multi-tenancy. The other things we're looking to do is uh, some of our teams have a wish for containers, like everyone does today. Uh, so essentially, we want to offer bare metal servers, virtual machines, or containers. So with the new Azure upgrade, we can actually plug in and use a container network integrated with uh, Nuage, which means that you don't have that double networking layer where you run your subnet and then essentially have your container network. Also, for backups, we're also looking at the, the Freezer project, which will allow us, through the OpenStack APIs, to orchestrate backups rather than going to third-party backup agents. And I'm not sure we've got much time, but this was Dave meeting the local Red Sox guy. It was a great I day. don't think he liked them much. And um, we also have um, <laughs> our i2 private cloud white paper that we're published. Um, we just want other users that want to go on a similar journey to basically have something like this. We would have benefited greatly if that had been available when we were starting this journey. So we're, we're keen to share, it, share our experiences there. And you can look at it in more detail. Do we have time for questions, or will I get off the stage? I think we have. One question. One question. OK, one question, 16 parts. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, Nicely yeah, done. Just, just two, two, two main questions. One, I'm wondering, what, you, what kind of uptime are you getting from your customer side of the application, you know, your customer viewpoint, in terms of uptime that you're measuring, that you're seeing with this, these architectures that you've been following? And, yeah. Delivering on today. So we're a 24 7 business. So if we don't have 100% uptime, then we lose business. Uh, so generally, what we've done with this model is we've designed it for failure. So we have infrastructure failures now and again. We have boxes that go down in DCs. What we've done with this design is make sure that that doesn't impact the customer so they don't see it. So we, we'll get paged out. We've actually had scenarios where we've lost a percentage of the application and the development teams get paged and they go, leave it to Monday until we come in when it's over the weekend. So that's really the state that we want to get to. We don't want, you've lost a hypervisor, 10 apps are down. So we've got away from that completely. So you have percentage failures in your DC, but you don't affect customers. <laughs>